Hey everyone, welcome back to High Tea Hoops. This is Brian Boucher at the Duke of Hoops, and I am joined by Skylar Smith, the Duchess of Hoops. What's up, Duchess? Hi, Brian. Super excited to talk to our first WBBL player today. I know. We have been trying to for a while, and yeah. I am so excited to bring on Christina Gaskin of the Lester Riders and a marketing consultant. Christina, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're, this is going to be exciting. You just, you're rolling off of a huge WBBL Cup win yesterday, or not huge, but you blew them out in the fourth quarter. You were undefeated through the different stages, so it's a pretty exciting time to catch up with you. But just to get started for our audience, do you want to give yourself uh, a little intro? What's your background in basketball? Uh, would love to just hear kind of high level who you are. Yeah, so I started playing basketball um, relatively late. I guess, for the international world of basketball. Um, and I started playing at the time because six, five, six, six at the time. So it was a tremendous challenge for me. You know, like I lost every single game that we played on, mm -hmm. on the driveway together. Um, but I just fell in love with the sport. And although I was horrendous at the <laughs> beginning and couldn't make a basket if my life depended on it, somehow I still managed to enjoy it and found it really fun to be in a team environment. So you know, kept working hard, um, became quite like a gym rat, I guess, um, in my earlier junior career and joined a club and managed to work really hard within uh, sort of the club basketball, also with some of my school coaches at the time. And um, got to a point where I guess someone saw some kind of talent in me because they picked me for sort of regional teams. And um, from there, I got picked to um, represent or join the, the national team um, training camp. Yeah, where I finally amazing. was able to join the under 16 European Championship team, I think in 2009, which feels like a lifetime ago to say. Um, <laughs> Seriously. But I was only 14 at the time. So that was a huge experience for me. Um, first time on the international stage, seeing international competition. And even though obviously I didn't, didn't play a lot during that competition, I think it was really great to be able to see the disparity in terms of the level of the game in Europe versus mm. what we understood the level of the game to be domestically. And mm -hmm. I think even currently, it's quite hard for younger players to realize that, you know, in England where basketball is relatively small and mm -hmm. growing, but still small, you can feel like a big fish in, in a small pond. But, you know, as soon as you get out into the broader basketball world and you see like European hoops or even, you know, college hoops, you realize that you're actually just a, a tiny fish in, in a massive ocean. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of humbled me um, and pushed me to work really hard as a junior. Um, I was never satisfied. I was quite relentless in my training efforts, probably too much so at some time. And I was able to secure a scholarship to play college basketball uh, for Fordham University, which is in the A-10 conference yep. on the East Coast of America in New York. Which is a huge accomplishment for any yeah. British basketball player. There's not that yeah, many that get those D1 scholarships. Definitely. And I was extremely grateful. I had a few different options to choose from. So um, I landed on New York because it's a really good academic school as well as, mm -hmm. you know, a good like basketball program. So mm -hmm. it was important for me to develop both sides of, of my sort of dual career at that point. Um, we won uh, the A-10 championship my junior year. So we went mm -hmm. to the NCAA tournament, lost in the first round. But to even <laughs> be mean, there still was made a huge feat. March yeah, Madness. Which is, yeah, which is something to, to really be um, proud of. Do and people then, in the UK understand March Madness and just like how much of a cultural phenomenon it is? I don't think that people in the UK generally understand or appreciate how big sports is in America. Like, mm -hmm. and I think that's like one of the struggles. Like when I was in college in America as an athlete, I was celebrated. Like we were like the pinnacle of, of the students within, yeah. you know, the college. Yeah. Um, and people looked up to you. You're a role model, you know. Yeah. And at some schools, I imagine you're somewhat of a celebrity. Whereas you know, growing up in the UK and playing sport, it's like, why are you playing basketball? Isn't that a guy's <laughs> sport? You know, why, wh why are you choosing to do that? So it's just a completely different stereotype. Um, and it was nice to step overseas actually, and to be celebrated as a, especially as a female um, yeah. playing sport. Cause that was something that at least, you know, growing up as a junior player in this country, it wasn't something that was really you know, celebrated and it's getting bigger nowadays as more media surrounding female sports. But obviously I think in college in America with Title IX and um, mm -hmm. the equality that's, that's been brought about because of that, there's just so much more um, resources and like attention towards female sports. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't know, Title IX, it was a mandate for college sports where uh, you had to have an equal number of scholarships for men as women. So with men playing American football, where there's like, I don't know, 100 players, that means there's a lot more scholarships available for women. So maybe on the tennis team or basketball team for men, there might be two or three scholarships where for women, there's five or seven. So you have a lot more opportunity to grow that side. And that's why we typically are very good at women's sports in the US. Just look at our women's soccer team versus <laughs> our men's soccer team nationally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Skylar understands. Skylar went to University of Michigan. So just very the college basketball, yeah. Yeah, they are, yeah. they're huge on campus. I actually yeah. grew up in Michigan. I spent a lot of my childhood there. Really? Whoa, where? Where? Um, Novi. I don't know. <laughs> oh that my god. That is so god. weird. That's like an hour from where I grew up. That is so weird. Really? Yeah. So you mean you came out of Michigan and you're not a Pistons fan? How did that happen? <laughs> so I was very young. Um, in my defense, okay. at the time, uh, I think I moved to America when I was one, one and a half, with my family. My dad had a, a career move. Um. And I was there for four or five years. And then we came back to England. And then I actually went mm -hmm. back a second time to Michigan for two or three years. So I spent a large part of my early childhood in America. So I somewhat Whoa. have a bit of an identity crisis from, from that situation. <laughs> but that's a story from another day. That I just, I, crazy. I'm imagining like six-year-old Christina, like kicking Skylar's ass in basketball in like some, <laughs> some Michigan basketball league. <laughs> that would be amazing. Maybe. Honestly. Maybe it happened. We'll have to we'll have to get together after this call and uh, talk some shit about that state. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to hear more though about what it was like transitioning from British basketball to college basketball. So you know, you kind of touched on you know, there's a lot more recognition for uh, women ballers in the U.S. and kind of I read your blog and how you guys get like the insane gear and you get you know just like 150 pieces of gear every year and how that's like not even really a thing in the UK but was there a transition as far as uh, the playing style went was there a transition as far as kind of um, how you interacted with coaches or teammates with the cultural differences what was kind of that transition like? So um, I think one of the most poignant things that I explained to some of my American teammates when I was a freshman in college was, you know, they were really impressed that I've obviously had the opportunity to play for my national team and to travel mm -hmm. to all these different European countries playing basketball. But when I explained to them that quite often, a lot of the time I had to pay to be able to do that as a junior mm -hmm. player in this country, because there just isn't the money in the sport to be able to, um, you know, justify paying for all of these different camps that we had to go on training camps um, and yep. the flights that we'd have to pay to travel and granted there was a certain budget but it was never enough to cover the entirety of the program and you know the coaches and team managers at the time did a very good job of trying to um, allocate resources when, and partner with people so that we could maximize as much as possible our preparation etc mm -hmm. but you know going from that to go into a program that has a budget in excess of sort of hundred and fifty thousand dollars in, in mm -hmm. any given yeah. season it was just insane to me, you know, I'm, you know, playing for my national team, having to pay to be able to be on my national team to attending a team where we're taking chartered flights from one game to the next um, <laughs> yeah. on a weekly basis. So it was just night and day um, in terms of the, the resource and the money that sort of funded the programs. But I think to answer your question in terms of some of the adjustments and, and cultural differences, I think the style of play, it's no secret, is extremely different in Europe to America um, and more personally to me, I'm used to playing with a lot of freedom um, having the ability to, to make decisions, to push the ball, play at like a very high pace. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often with that, with European basketball, sometimes there are like more turnovers or, you know, you play higher possession games, um, but you'll see more like creativity and more independence given to the players to be able to make the decisions on court. And one of the first things that I noticed playing in the States is that at least the the team that I was on, was it heavily structured? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the sets were called by the coach from the sideline. Um, we ran a very, very slow paced game, a lot of screen action, um, not a lot of like motion, free movement kind of offenses. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of found myself trying to be a square peg fitting into a circle hole at times. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of my advantages playing basketball is that like my speed for my size or, mm -hmm. um, my ability to sort of just be quicker than uh, most bigs to be able to attack them mm. on the perimeter. But then um, 
if they tried to put a guard on me, then I can go inside and post them up. So that was kind of my offensive advantage. And yeah. because I didn't really fit within the structure that I was playing in in college, like I found it really difficult because I tried to manipulate my game to kind of fit the system that I was in, which ultimately I think um, was far too difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. You see that with so many college programs where the coaches have so much power and yeah. it's their system or out. I know I went to Dartmouth where your scholarship doesn't depend on the sport that you play, luckily. So you get a lot of people coming in, going to that gear day where they get their hundred pieces of gear and then they'll quit the team because right. the system just doesn't fit for them. Or there's a new recruiting class come in, coming in that replaces mm-hmm. you and the coach wants their recruiting class. Or if the coach changes, yeah. I mean, that just throws the entire uh, team in disarray. But it's such a difficult challenge. And you see that even in like NBA where – You'll have, mm-hmm. I think there was a sixth man drafted fourth. I think Patrick Williams was a sixth man on his team and he's the fourth draft of the, or fourth pick of the NBA draft. Um, yeah. But yeah, I can see how you can get stuck there. And I, I think mm-hmm. another sort of big um, realization for me was I grew up playing in basketball in this country where you're largely surrounded by volunteers or people that mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. basically within the sport because they're passionate about the sport. There's, there's no real money and that's not a secret for anyone. So anyone that's involved in basketball in this country for the most part is doing so because they're extremely passionate about the game Mm -hmm. and that coming from that kind of motivation I think allows players to feel comfortable and confident that that coach has their best interests at heart because they want you to succeed as much as they want to succeed Um, but I think because of the financial element when you play in college and the pressure that's put on coaches to to win at all costs and to have to succeed and make sure that you know they have a winning program Mm-hmm. that kind of funnels down towards the players. And I think you're no longer seen necessarily as an athlete, but you're seen as an asset to them within the program. Yeah. And so yeah. if you're an asset that's not producing, then you can sometimes get overlooked or you can get um, undervalued. Whereas uh, growing up in the UK, because we're surrounded by people that you know aren't doing it for a financial gain, then they really do, I think, have your best interests at heart for the most part. And obviously I'm yep. generalizing, um, but that was a big adjustment for me to sort of realizing that the sport and the, um, the passion that I had was kind of manipulated into a, a business kind of environment and having to have that mindset that it's a business and I need to turn up and perform every day and mm-hmm. do my job and not just play because I really love the sport. Yeah, we don't have to turn this into an NCAA podcast because Skylar and I have some pretty strong opinions there where yeah. you are professional athletes and you are taken advantage of by the coaches and the systems and you become those free assets. But we don't have to get into that. If you haven't read your blog post uh, or listened to your different stories on uh, how college basketball almost killed you, I encourage you to do that. It's an incredibly powerful piece, but yeah. we don't have to cover it here because you've covered it in a number of different places. So I want to move on to, you know, after Fordham, What excited you about the opportunity to go back to the UK and to play in the WBBL? So I think for me, my main quest on returning back home, initially, like I wasn't going to play basketball again. Mm -hmm. Um, I worked in real estate in New York for a long time after I graduated and I thought I wouldn't play basketball again. But then working in in Westminster in London, I realized I actually really miss the game. Um, Mm -hmm. And I want to get back into it in a capacity where my main priority is to find enjoyment in playing again. Mm-hmm. um as a as a number one and obviously uh, working at the time in london the logical transition for me was to um to play with the the london gosh i don't know the why a i'm lions. struggling to remember what the, yeah, yeah the london lions there we go yes, the Sorry, london I lions. Played with them two years and i can't remember the um <laughs> no worries so yeah so i played with the the lions for a couple of years and and then i was uh, playing in a game actually where a European scout was watching um, the game afterwards because he he was the agent of one of the players on the team and he was trying to find her a professional team overseas and he actually reached out to me and said look have you ever considered playing professionally and obviously at that point that wasn't a really a consideration in my mind but um, I wasn't really ready to launch myself fully into the workforce and to to give up on basketball and to retire yeah. per se So um, I worked with him and that's when I was able to sign my first professional contract playing in Italy. Wow. So going back, how long was the gap between you graduating and working and then actually going and playing professional? Um, Probably about three years, actually. Ryan okay. is asking this question for himself, by it's, the way. That's a little longer than me. I'm trying to get back into it. He's desperate to get back. NBL teams out there. 
just, you know, use a visa spot on me if you're listening. Not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Three years is a little shorter though. I've, I'm like 10 years now and it's, it, it might be a lost cause at this point. But um, so what is it, what was playing for the BA Lions like? So you mentioned you signed your first professional contract. Was it more amateur at that time? I know the WBBL started in what, 2011 or something. So it's more, it's yeah. more recent. So what was it like playing then? And what's the difference between that and signing your first contract? So um, it's an interesting setup with the BA London Lions because um, they are attached or affiliated with an academy structure. So a lot of the up and coming talent that are looking to, to go to America, um, they play in the league as, you know, with the priority of developing those players. Yeah. But then they yeah. obviously, to be able to be competitive, they surround themselves with normally a few other professional players to raise the standard and obviously just, you know, help them be able to get through the season and compete against some of the better teams in the league. Um, so at the time, a lot of like my experience there having returned from America was mentoring and leading the team and trying to, you know, like when you're surrounded by a team with younger players, you have a lot of teething problems where you've got to try and yes. not only teach them how to do something, but like why it's important to do something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's quite often a struggle. And, um, you know, although like I'm very passionate about giving back and um, helping other people follow in, in my footsteps at the same time, sometimes you just want to rock up to a practice mm -hmm. and yeah. just play and not yeah. have to do the whole leadership component and, and worry about other different sort of developmental things that you have to take care of. Yes. I love the teething problems <laughs> reference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you won the trophy last season with the Riders. What was that journey like to get the trophy before the season was canceled? I, when I look back, I think that we were extremely fortunate to be in that position. One, to, to be playing in a league where there is an opportunity to win a championship so early in the season. Yeah. Um, quite often you'll play the whole season before you get to playoffs. And so I know we're wrapping our heads teams. around trophy yeah, I, cup and yeah. championship. It's like, it makes sense. It's good that you could, I wish the NBA did something similar, but I'm like the trophy's not the championship, but it's not the cup. We're still learning. I know, but you win a trophy if you win the cup and you win. A, like, I know exactly. Um, I was even confused when I first came back to, like, <laughs> to decide for the different, I, I was just trying to win every weekend. I didn't know what yeah. it necessarily meant. Um, but yeah, so we were really fortunate to be able to, you know, benefit from the fact that the league is structured this way and to be able to have a final so early on in the season. And I think we had an extremely talented team last year. So I think if we hadn't have had the opportunity to play that game, I think I would have always thought like, what if, like what mm -hmm. could we have done if the season had gone on a little bit longer? And I think a lot of teams internationally would have turned around and said like they had unfinished business last season. Like you look at Oregon in the States, which, you know, one of my, form one of my current teammates yeah, Holly Winterburn. Um, used to play with. Yeah. I think that, you know, they'll probably look like, you know, what could they have done? Would they have like gone all the way and uh, won the NCAA cha championship? Um, and at least we can turn around and say that, you know, we had that opportunity. We got to play in a final as a team because yep. um, it was very much touch and go. It was, wasn't something that was guaranteed at the time. And yeah, I think that we're all like very grateful for that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you got, you snuck in a win there before everything was canceled. I think your, what well, your, your Instagram post was like, we might get COVID because we played in this, but at least we snuck out with a trophy <laughs> before we all went into lockdown. <laughs> Which like that March, no, that like early true. on, it, we were, it, was, it was a little scary. Like, should we be playing? I remember playing in our league games here in the States. It's like, oh, are we supposed to be on the court right now or not? But <laughs> Right. Yeah. Snag the win. And in hindsight, I think if we knew what we knew now, then we that championship would have yeah. definitely not gone oh, ahead. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of like the ignorance is bliss kind of. Yeah. In yes. That we allowed to play that championship with, with uh, without any forethought of what was about to come. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so we watched this weekend – um, love that the that the Riders and uh, the Eagles live stream the WBBL games. It's hard to watch WBBL games um, without going in person. And obviously we can't go in person now, but I like that they actually streamed this weekend. And you re-signed along Kate Oliver, who had an incredible game yesterday. Uh, Sarah Hen Heinrich's daughter? Heinrich's daughter? Heinrich's daughter, yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, and you brought on Holly Winterburn, as we discussed this year. So you, your, your team is stacked. You are loaded. You, I would expect you to be one of the big favorites this year. You've been undefeated. Coming in and re-signing the season, what has it been like preparing? What were your expectations for the season? What has it been like kind of get ready, at, ready after that trophy uh, win last year? I think that um, it was really nice to know that, you know, 
particularly Kate was going to come back um, and, yep. and rejoin the team because um, Sarah's studying with me this year. So we were both doing our masters. So like, I kind of yep. knew that that was going to be the case. Um, but I think like, arguably, I think Kate is the best five in the league um, in terms of versatility. Like some mm. may argue that um, Joyner with the Wildcats is also up for contention yep. at that position. But I think that, that Kate wins it in terms of being able to like her, have her outside threat as well as inside threat. Yeah. Well, um, over a sequence so yesterday, she hit a three, she did a backdoor cut reverse layup and she did a post move. And the announcers were like, holy shit, like she is doing <laughs> everything out there. And that's truly like how she is as a player. You know, she, if you stop her in the post, then she can step out and, and shoot the three. Um, so I think that it's really, it's lovely to have Sarah back as well. Obviously a big score for us last year, um, mm -hmm. led the team um, in a lot of categories. So I was confident coming in and then obviously the excitement in having Holly Winterburn returning from America and joining us, yeah. like that was a huge signing for us, but not forgetting other people like Hannah Robb, who just had her first debut with yep. the senior national team. Um, and like we're, and then obviously you've got Ella Clark who's played on the senior national team in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so we really do have a lot of depth. And I think one of our biggest advantages uh, this year, uh, probably similar to last year is that, if they take away one of our scoring threats, then mm -hmm. someone else can step up. Um, so it's really hard to probably scout and prepare for us as a team because not only in, in any position like Kate, for example, who you know can score both inside and out, we also then have two or three players that can do something similar. So yep. um, I think that we do take collective responsibility offensively uh, and we play really well as a team. I think that's a testament to the fact that we've had an extremely long preseason as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were up training at sort of the end of August. So wow. we've had a lot of time to prepare. And I think having, looking at the sort of systems that we tried to put in last year, which are similar to what we're doing this year, mm -hmm. I think it took us far longer last year to get to certain defensive rotations or defensive nuances where we're already at that point this year. So mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. great. And I think, Yes, where our coach has already acknowledged that. So, yeah, I mean, you were one of the WBBL players of the week last week. I think we watched yesterday. You're doing a lot of dirty work. You're getting the offensive rebounds, kicking it out. You're getting the blocks. You're playing good defense. What would you say your role is on this team, where you obviously have a lot of talent? I think for me, I one of my roles is like to shoot the ball when I'm open. Mm -hmm. um, to but like you said, to I think I'm a defensive player more than an offensive player. Um, I mean, you didn't miss I, any threes yesterday. True. That must no. have felt good. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. So I, I try and focus on playing defense, um, playing within our system, getting stops, um, being aggressive, kind of like leading the team in defensive intensity, mm -hmm. and then um, pushing the ball in transition. I don't think we got as many opportunities to do so yesterday, but normally we like get a lot more uh, opportunities to run, run the floor. Um, mm -hmm. And I like that our coach here allows us to push the ball one through five. You know, he doesn't yeah. dictate that we need to outlet it to the point guard and then like walk the ball up the floor and run a set. Um, so that can be quite exciting to watch, I think. Yeah. Um, but that, then, yeah, I think like in, in any given game, um, depending on like who we're playing and, uh, you know, how we anticipate they'll scout us, then I think everyone's role sort of tweaks a little bit depending mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um, tactically what we're trying to look for in that game. Yeah, it yeah. makes a lot of sense. I think every player we bring on to this podcast, we just like want to be able to get to know their teammates. Like we, I feel like in the NBA, we know these players so well, we have a good grip on their personalities and we just want to get uh -huh. to know the BBL and WBBL players just as well. Mm -hmm. So we kind of run through these like superlatives with every player we bring on. So who's okay. the funniest player on your team? The, like without a doubt, Whitney Allen. Um, <laughs> that was a quick answer. She's like, yeah, seriously. She's hilarious. Um, both in like, you know, when someone's funny, just in their like mannerisms, like you might be in practice <laughs> and like coach will say something and you like scan the room just to sort of read the reactions of people. Uh -huh. And she's the person that like has it written all over her face. Like, <laughs> just um, can't hide so, it. Yeah. So that makes me laugh. And like, she's just like funny in general. Um, but in terms of you want to know who like, I think the funniest person in the league is, is Rian Bailey. She plays at Manchester and I played junior basketball with her. Hilarious. Probably one of the funniest people I know. <laughs> like, Does that translate okay. to on court too? Like, are they funny on yeah. the court? Yeah. Even when, even when I play like Rianne, um, you know, like when you just have like a little friendly banter, like during the game, uh -huh. like you're talking about stuff, like just as like a joke, like 
yeah, that's like, I look forward to playing Manchester just to have that like conversation with her. Yeah, the free throw line banter where you're just waiting yeah. for the, yeah, just, just elbowing each other, yeah. Yeah. Going off of that, is there a good trash talker on your team? Who's got the Great best question. trash talk? Oh, see, I don't think that we have that on our team. And sometimes like, I wish that we did, like just for entertainment purposes. You can always sign me if you need me. I got <laughs> you. That can be my role. Just the heckler Honestly, from the sideline. Yeah. Honestly, I just think that we're quite like humble in the way that we sort of act and why well, I hope that we yeah. come across to other people. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really think we have that person. Nothing from Holly. She looks like she gets like a snarl on sometimes, but it seems like she like attacks more in that mode than maybe trash talking. I feel like, yeah, I feel like if people get annoyed, you can tell because they'll just like go at someone, you know, yeah. like they'll translate, it'll translate into how they're playing versus like what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Who has the best style on the team? And I'm going to say, you can say yourself because I have stalked you on Instagram and you have great style. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to say myself. I was going to say um, probably Holly, actually. Holly or Sarah. But when I say the best style, they're probably just the two people that if someone said, who do you want to switch wardrobes with? Like those would be the two yeah. people. That's a good Mostly because base. Holly's got so many cool like things from Oregon and like from, yeah, yeah. like she gets sent things from Nike. So it's, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. If you want gear, go to University of Oregon. Seriously. You, you got the <laughs> Nike connection there. I have yeah. another I have another one for the team. Who's the glue person on the team or the locker room person? You also Good you thing. often hear that. Who kind of brings the whole team together? Um I would probably say Kate and myself. Um I think that's something that like's been consistent across my basketball career is like and obviously been in varied situations where, you know, when I played in Italy, I was, you know, one of the more important people on the team, but I've also played in college where, you know, a lot of the, my later part of my college career, I sat on the bench um, and then being here, like I, it doesn't, it's not important to me um, that I score like 10, 15 points in a game and, and have a double double or make, you know, the all-star five. It's important to me that we win. Um, and so I'm willing to do whatever's necessary to like sort of invoke that kind of motivation um, yep. and willingness to win from, from others. And so, I do take pride in trying to keep everyone on the same page, trying to keep everyone positive um, mm -hmm. and encourage and like motivate people both in practice and in games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see it on the court. I was like, shoot, shoot, shoot yesterday. I'm like, you're coming on the pod. Let's get another three. <laughs> but you just kick it out to the open person. You're unselfish. I was like, oh, yeah. be more selfish for the podcast, Christina. Come on. We want to glow. <laughs> Something I'm working on in, in my life as well, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a struggle. Uh, that's another podcast. Um, what other... <laughs> Uh, what young players uh, should we really be looking out for maybe on the riders or in the WBBL in general, who are you really impressed by for some up and comers? Um, so on our team, we have a, um, a younger player. She's been training with us like since preseason, mm -hmm. um, Katie Janacevska. And mm. I'm commentating a little bit at the moment in some of her division one games. So I'm really <laughs> trying to get her name pronunciation down, but I feel like I just got it wrong again. Um, <laughs> But she, so she played in, um, she's under 16 last year and she had games where she scored in excess of like 35, 40 points. Jeez. Um, so she's like really like someone to, to look, um, look out for. But then obviously she played in, in division two, I believe last year as well and still dominated in that league. So like it was really time this year for her to step up into the next level and to be able to, you know, train with us every day and to compete with a lot of like professional players with a lot of experiences, I think it's going to do her the world of good. Um, and so, and she's, I think you can tell when someone's going to, or has the potential to, to develop into a great player because they just listen, you know, like they're yeah. willing to learn and they listen. And yeah. there's a lot of talented players out there that just think they already know the answer or just like you'll speak to them, but they don't want to hear it. And I think having someone that just wants to soak up as much knowledge as possible and um, mm -hmm. really listens and tries to understand and even asks questions. Um, yeah. I think that's a real recipe for success with junior players. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. I'm excited certainly. to follow her career yeah. and see how she does. Just like you mentioned where you are playing in the UK, then you go to Europe and your eyes open up a little bit wider and you see how the level increases. It's even in the States growing up in AAU, there's always a level above you. So yeah. be mm -hmm. humble. You can always be learning, especially from the better players and the people older than you. Um, but yeah, I, everyone, you know, every young player should take that lesson of, of listen uh, and try to learn because you're, you're not going to be the best player in the world. Yeah, hundred percent. Coachability is so important. Yeah. Um, we Definitely. mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you you are a marketing consultant. 
we would love for you to grace us with some knowledge. Uh, <laughs> what do you think the B WBBL can do to grow interest in basketball in the UK? Let's tap into that marketing brain a little bit. This so is a big question that, too. It is a big question. <laughs> it, it is a huge question. Um, no pressure. But I think that um, one of the struggles that we face uh, in the WBL and the female league in this country is that there's so little money. Yeah. So um, obviously you have to spend a little money to make a, a little bit of money. And I think mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in that concept. So it is a hard to, to sort of run initiatives and to, um, to develop the game without that resource. Um, but having said that, I think that a lot of uh, clubs have had success partnering with schools and local grassroots program and really mm -hmm. trying to develop the community program within the area that they um, exist in. So for us, that means community coaching that we, we host at the university. And we also go around to, in, in a non-COVID world, we go around to primary schools. I did a lot of assemblies last year where I spoke to, um, spoke to the entire school around my pathway in basketball and how you know, joining and playing sport, even if it's not basketball, is a really positive thing. Um, so sort of just spreading the word, because I think one of the struggles that we have in England in general is that basketball is not played from a young age. It's not something you do in primary school and sometimes not even mm -hmm. in secondary school. So um, offering that as, as an option um, mm -hmm. within schools mm -hmm. and partnering within schools, like that's, a, I think, a great way to, to grow like the community aspect of the game and to grow participation levels from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But again, like I'm not um, denying the reality that I do think that more needs to be done in terms of partnering with perhaps even like corporations that have, you yeah, know, absolutely. women, uh, you know, corporate board members that are really passionate about sport and uh, really want to give back to female sport and finding investment in, in that way and being a little bit more creative and working out how we can see it as a more of like a, a charitable aspect um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a business investment. Because I think sometimes in the past, like you're probably familiar with the Royals that, that joined yes. the, the league for, for one season and then, you know, mm -hmm. had a lot of financial, were rumored to have a lot of financial um, issues and then uh, no longer exist now. Yes, so burnt out quickly. Yeah. So I think sometimes the struggle is that, you know, we have investors or people that, that come in and have these lofty ambitions and have this idea of what they want to do, you know, save British mm -hmm. basketball and transform like the heritage of um, and the direction of British basketball in this country. But I don't think that they realistically sit down and think about, you know, how they're going to do that. Like what, how are they going to increase the amount of fans that they're going to have at games? And then they yeah. suddenly realize they get a few months into the season that they're like, this return on my investment that I was expecting, because I was expecting to, to fill out the copper box or whatever arena it yeah. may be, mm -hmm. is not quite there. Um, but, but you didn't really have a real strategy behind doing so. Um, yeah. And I think that comes from having people that have both a business and basketball mindset mm -hmm. um quite often like i'm working on a project right now with basketball england into you know junior athletes transition from being in this country to going to america and, mm -hmm. and how we can support that and provide more resource um but they brought me on board because i'm very familiar with basketball and i've also lived the experience but then mm -hmm. they've obviously got the resource and the investment to be able to to bring it to life and i think those kind of partnerships really make sense um and in this country, we do have a lot of really great um, business people and, and people within the basketball network. But I think sometimes communication is lacking and we don't really unify to create like one strategy to really grow the sort of both the national programs and the domestic leagues. We kind of look at, we we'll sit on little islands and try and um, do things in isolated ways. So mm -hmm. those that are was kind of a big question. That was, that was a big a question great and you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's solved there you go wbbl we just gave you the answer no but i mean it's not it's, easy i yeah, yeah i say all that and i know that it's like it's not easy even the project yeah. that i've been working on with basketball england like you've got a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives so trying to like you know bring everyone together and and make sense of it and develop something at the end that, that makes a difference it's not always straightforward yeah. yeah. Well, coming in from Americans, it's like, okay, there's, there's 66 million people. There's so many sports fans in the UK. Uh, basketball is one of the most played sports um, for youth. Mm -hmm. It's taught in schools. Uh, the NBA is huge. NBA 2K is huge. Why isn't basketball more popular? Why aren't there more resources in the BBL, WBBL? And mm -hmm. it's kind of, that's where you see maybe like, hey, we can come save British basketball with just some, some investment and then you get burnt out quickly. And I think what you're talking about of investing in the community and the schools and the programs is such a powerful piece. Cause we see that in, in the WNBA in the States where 
yeah. lucky enough mm-hmm. to be very close to the uh, the championship Seattle Storm, which Skylar, I knew I would slip that in there every nice. episode. Go, <laughs> go Storm. But you see the crowds and it is a lot of the youth development programs. It's a lot of the community. It's a lot of the schools that are fans as opposed yeah. to, uh, you know, in mm-hmm. contrast to the NBA. So I think that's such a powerful piece. What do you see um, or, or, you know, what are some of your thoughts on 777 partners who bought the London Lions and you see the government putting in more investment, or I guess it's a loan, but it seems like this season there is a lot more momentum for British basketball, um, whether it's, you know, in, in Eurobasket or the London Lions going into Europe. Do you feel that energy on the ground that there is momentum or does it feel like another one of these London Royals come in, try to save British basketball thing? Um, I think that the any investment is good um i just would love to see the longevity and consistency of that investment Mm -hmm. obviously because you know we've seen in the past that people sort of dip their toes in the water and then realize quickly that actually it doesn't return you know give them the return they want um and quickly withdraw from the situation so i'm hesitant in saying that you know i think that it's going to be a long-term success but at the same time I don't want to discredit the organization um, and the ambition that they have in terms of returning to Europe. It's something that, you know, having been previously part of the the Lions club that they've been looking to do for a long time. Um, And now obviously with the the finances available to do so, I think that is a positive thing for the league. And I think Mm -hmm. in hearing the recent rumor that they're looking to perhaps invest in the the wider league um, of the the WBBL, BBL, um, I think that would be a really positive thing because I think that you, you can't just bring one team. Sorry, I might have lost you. There. You can't just bring one team up in isolation. I think that you need to um, look at the entirety of the league mm-hmm. um, because a lot of, a lot of discussion obviously in preseason this year was, wow, Lions have signed another player, another guy, and yes, another player. Another like, NBA player. You know, you know, are they just going to beat everyone in the BBL by like 50 and then their yeah. priority mm-hmm. is going to go, you know, to European competitions. Um, and that arguably doesn't necessarily raise the profile of the league as a whole. Um, yeah. It perhaps just raises the profile of that one team. Yeah. And so I think that it would be a really wise decision for them to invest in the, the broader sort of landscape of the league um, and then give other opportunities to be able to sign more, you know, notable talent. Um, not that we don't have, you know, great talented players already you yeah. know, playing in the league, but, I think that brings excitement for fans as well. You know, like people that love to come and watch an, uh, an NBA game when they play in London, all of a sudden, like maybe if they can sign, you know, some D league players, um, they can create more excitement around yeah. the game domestically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think just the storytelling around the players too is so huge. If they had that marketing budget, cause you're talking about the funniest player in the league, the one who has the best style as fans, we don't see a lot of that. There's not investment in kind of telling those stories and getting us mm. uh, interested in the games through the players, which is largely how the NBA and WNBA have become successful. Um, so yeah, I would love to see more investment there. And I think you're right. It's just the consistency part of it. You've got to see mm-hmm. it for the years and it takes a long time to change the culture. Right. And if they're willing to obviously put this investment in over a, you know, an, a five years, which they have initially committed to, mm-hmm then, you know, as long as there's a strategy um, underlying it and there's obviously a good marketing plan, campaign or plan to execute, um, you know, to continue to develop Lions as a, as a brand and maybe the BBL as a whole, then um, I'm sure that that will, that will go a long way to making a big difference. Yeah. Well, you're on Sky now, or at least the BBL is starting there. Maybe they'll pull up some WBBL games, but first TV deal, what, since the 2000s? The aughts? Yeah. yeah Which is huge. crazy. So yeah, looking forward to seeing it on TV because I think that was a big thing that they were trying to push of, hey, we have all these viewers. We have, all, we have this huge audience, which you can mm-hmm. see on YouTube in the live streams. Um, I'm really glad that they're doing a more of a, a production, which starts this Thursday, actually, I think. Mm-hmm. That's really exciting. No, it's uh, definitely, there's been a lot of speak, obviously, around uh, the league pass and et cetera. So, oh, yes. You know, we won't go there, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we can. You mean the single club pass? Easy. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, don't be mischievous. Don't be mischievous. We'll Sorry. move on. We'll wrap up here. Uh, we came off some heavy questions. We'll finish on a light one. Uh, the writers are off to a hot start this season. What what uh, message do you have for writers fans going into this upcoming, or I guess you're in it, going into this season? Yeah, I think that um, it's a little bit of a different season, but hopefully, you know, mm-hmm. we do a really good job at Leicester of, of providing media content and, 
keeping the fans up to date with games. Um, we really appreciate the ongoing support that we have from um, various different well, age groups and people and hopefully you know when it comes to playing our probably biggest game of the season against seven oaks um we can see something slightly different this year and um, we beat them last year when it mattered to get through to the, yep. the final of the trophy um but we obviously lost to them earlier in the season last mm -hmm. year so i think that's going to be the big game of the season and something to really look out for 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 riders fans going forward as new american fans is, the, is it a Seven Oaks rivalry with the Riders? I see you going back and forth on all of the standings going back years. Is that like the big rivalry in the WBBL? I think it's our biggest competition. Um, Seven Oaks have like, you know, won the league for the last, I'm not sure. Like they've had like a very, you know, good run um, yes. for the last like five or six years. So um, they're always the, the team that you kind of want to knock off that kind of pedestal a little bit. Um, and they have tremendous like, talent they recruit very well and um, mm -hmm. a lot of the their core group have been playing to, together for several years now so um yeah it'll be a really great challenge for us and I think those are the games that I'm most excited about because you get the opportunity to to see who turns up and play their best basketball on that day yeah absolutely well you're on to the WBBL cup semifinals, which I think is against the Cardiff Met Archers which we also watched this weekend where they lost the Lions so the Lions only won one, but it was against the, the Archers, which we watched. So best of luck there. And thank you so much for coming on, Christina. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.